we're going to take a look at some of the facts that we've been promised and then some of the actual realities, some of the things that have come true in the communities where we're living. So first, I just want to say how proud I am to have somebody here from Slippery Rock. I moved to Slippery Rock when I was in third grade. I lived there for about 20 years, and I'm very confident and comfortable to know that we have such great people up there doing wonderful work, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the work that has been going on up there as well. Our guest, Robert Hines, was at Slippery Rock University for 32 years, taught geology there, and he's also taught at the Institute of Learning and Retirement in Slippery Rock. Okay. I'll turn the floor over to Bob. Okay, thank you. First of all, if you have any questions as we go along, don't feel that you have to wait till the very end to ask them. Just make it known that you have a question, and I'll be glad to, uh, to, to work with you on that. Now I have to get the screen back. It's that too long. The wonder of computers. <laughs> okay. Go back through this. There we go. Good. Uh, basically, I've been told that there are several people here who are rather interested and concerned about the earthquakes that have been happening over in the Youngstown area. Uh, I, that's not really an official part of the presentation, but as we go through, at some point I'll be glad to address that and, and talk about those and the geology and what, what the problem might be. So anyway, I'm going to start out, and this, this is longer than it should be, you have to admit, but I'm going to start out by talking about the Marcellus and Utica Shale and what the industry promises. <coughs> Not in any kind of written form, except that we see it on television all the time, oh, we hear from the politicians all the time, that this is what they're promising us to do. And here's a list of some of the promises that, that I, I personally uh, heard or seen uh, people uh, put forth. Energy independence for the United States, increased job growth in Pennsylvania, and other gas producing states too, obviously. Uh, decreased pollution from vehicles, electrical generating plants, uh, slowing down the greenhouse effect and environmental warming because of the decrease in pollution. Uh, landowners that have the mineral rights are going to essentially become fairly wealthy. Uh, there won't be any bad health problems for people or animals. Uh, our sources of water, aquifers, will not be contaminated. And the, uh, any surface disruption that occurs within the community because of the drilling procedures would be short-lived. And you'll hardly notice the finished sites. Those are the promises I've heard. Now, I don't know if you've heard of any additional ones, but those are the ones that I, I've heard and come up with. Quite honestly, <coughs> some of them are valid. But on the other hand, some of them there's some, some problems with. So we're going to go through each one. We're starting with that one that the United States is going to become energy independent. A dominant, uh, Dominion's uh, spokesman, Don Donovan, said that his company expects the Cove Point, Maryland uh, liquid natural gas terminal facility to become import and export facility as early as 2015. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, Cove Point, Maryland site, that's at the north end of Chesapeake Bay. Uh, because he says America is going to have excess natural gas, and uh, the drillers demand that the gas be exported, that it be sold and be exported. And when he said that, he didn't really mean the drillers. What he meant was, was the companies and the people who own the companies. Uh, and so let's look at some of these companies. The Barron Group, I went too far on that one. Here we are. Following companies have joint ventures with financiers or other companies in China, South Korea, India, Japan, and the United Kingdom. Uh, Korea, they're all in here. Uh, gas Star Exploration, 21, this, these percentage figures are the percentage amounts that these financiers or other companies have in the Marcellus and Utica gas exploration in the Appalachian Basin. 
which include West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New York City. Gastar, South Korea, has 21.43%. Uh, United Kingdom, they didn't uh, divulge how much they own, but they own a good part of export resources. Chesapeake sold out to China, for, or got financed by China for 33%. It was about $1.5 billion. And then they found out that they started running into debt, so they went and sold another 20% of their share to China to pay off the debt that they were in, in, in getting. And South Korean financiers put $200 million into it, bought that much of it. Japan owns almost a third of Anadarko Petroleum uh, gas exploration in this country. Uh, India owns 45% of Atlas Resources, which is now part of Chevron. Chevron uh, bought out uh, Atlas Energy. India has some of Korea's oil and gas, again, an unknown percentage. Uh, another one, India owns 45%. East Resources, uh, which is a limited liability corporation owned wholly by Royal Dutch Shell, which of course is Dutch, 100%. And, but their operations are largely in Tioga and Butler. And that's what we're seeing here in Butler County now, is Shell Oil. And they are not drilling for Marcellus, they're drilling for the Utica. And there's a reason for that. Uh, according to the Pennsylvania Oil and Gas Law, and you'll see, I'll, I'll show a diagram of this later, but there's a formation in the Devonian rock, age rocks, <coughs> called the Onondaga Formation, and the Marcellus is right above it. And way down here is the Utica. But according to the Pennsylvania Oil and Gas Law, at the present time, anything in the Onondaga or below can be taken by any company that's drilling, even if you don't have a lease with it. They can take it from you. It's called unitization, or it's called forced pooling. Uh, but that does mean they have to have a certain amount of the land around them that they do have leases on before they go under your property. The idea is, the reason for that was, that if a company has leases around and there's a few spotty ones that didn't lease, they're not going to, it's going to restrict the amount of gas they can get out of the ground. And so the rationale in the law is that it's for the conservation of the resource. And what it really means is not the conservation of the resource, it's the obtaining all of the resource you can get for the least amount of expense. And that's what forced pooling is, or unitization, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we'll talk more a little bit about that later. But in any event, uh, that's why they're going for the Utica, because they can do that. So if, if you've got two or three neighbors with large plots of land that are leased, and Shell is going down, or any company is going down to get to Utica, uh, basically they can go under unleased property also. They will have to pay a royalty for the gas they take from underneath that property. No doubt about that. This, this is in Pennsylvania now? This is in Pennsylvania. This is the Pennsylvania that the old oil and gas law that was passed back in the 60s. I remember the exact year, 65, 66, somewhere in that range. Okay. Bering Group is a member of what we call Pioga, Pennsylvania Independent Oil and Gas Association. It's based in Hong Kong, offices in Beijing, Vancouver, and Macau. None in the United States. And yet they're a member of this Pennsylvania Independent Oil and Gas Association. Wow. <laughs> XTO Energy and ExxonMobil have formed a new organization to manage their gas resources globally. And basically, there's a lot of gas being sold globally. So energy independence for the United States is kind of strange when you realize the reason that the companies are demanding that a lot of the gas be liquefied and shipped overseas is because it's these overseas people that own it. <coughs> The oil and gas industry is not a United States industry. It's a worldwide industry. Okay, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get to it. 
question? Yes. The data on your slides here, mm -hmm. is that available in that form somewhere accessible? So uh, that data, I, actually I got that data just off the internet. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember the, the, uh, the source, but I can, uh, I've got a copy of it, okay. and I can look that up. See me right after the meeting and I'll show up and give it to you. If anyone else is interested, I'll do it there too. Uh, just to make clear, you, uh, Chesapeake sold 32% and then 20%, so 50% or more? No, Chesapeake sold 33, about a third of their percent, or 32%, whatever it was, 30%, <coughs> sold that. In other words, it was financed by a foreign company. So that foreign company really owns that percentage. Of, of all of Chesapeake's Appalachian Basin. Marcellus. Not all. It's a part of the field. Yeah, right. Right. So and the 20% is a part of a different field. Right. Well, no. no the 20, well, 20% 20 was because they ran into financial problems. Chesapeake did. Would you like a little clarification? And, and they had to get refinanced. That's what the uh, article said. Yes, do. Well, Chesapeake has signed a lot of leases in this area. You probably all know that. And most of those leases say they have to drill within five years. Well, of course, it takes about $5 million to drill a well. So in order to raise funds to do that, they took parts of their, they, they've got several lease fields all over. They took a section that says, if you'll come up, and whoever it was, and this was available to domestic as well as foreign, if you will provide the drilling money, we will sell you a 33% share of what comes out of this, this field. And then for another field, they said, if you will provide the drilling money, we'll sell you 20% share of that field as a way of raising funds so they could drill. Because you got to put $5 million into the ground before you get anything out. So that's where the well, let's clarify joint ventures what you mean came into the field. I'm sorry? Clarify by what you mean by field. The, the Marcellus field is a very large field. Right. They so sold it, segments of that. One segment was 33%, as you said. Another segment, okay. but they didn't sell the 20% and the 33% of the same segment of the field. No, no. They're not, not additive. True. Those are percentages of different parts of the Marcellus right. field. And even, even, even if they were the same field, they still wouldn't be additive to get up to 50%, because 20% of what would be left would not be 50%. Okay. And this probably all came about as a result of overextension with respect to leasing, and they needed that money for the drilling well, to get within the five-year time frame. It just means frame. that just whatever reason, they, they had a bottom line problem, whatever yeah. reason, they needed to solve it. Now, for instance, well, Phillips sold out to XTO, which is owned by Exxon, because Phillips didn't have the money to drill exactly. the leases they had signed. Yes. Right. And so I'm Ron Mullenkamp. I'm in the investment business. I'm also a local okay. uh, on the farm just south of the right. airport. And uh, some of the, I might add, in keeping with that, some of the uh, some of the leases uh, that were signed originally, uh, there, there's quite a variation in, 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 in the upfront money that different le uh, leasers got. In some cases, they got just a lump sum once. In some cases, they got a lump sum, which was not nearly as big a lump sum, but they got it on an annual basis. Uh, those are some of the older leases. Uh, but interestingly enough, it's been reported that the people who got those leases were not necessarily the companies that are doing the drilling. And I think that's obvious, that if you've got a lease, and you're not going to be able to afford to do the drilling. You sell it to someone who does do the drilling. And some of the leases have bounced around a couple of times and uh, been sold to other people. So that, that's the larger corporations are gradually accumulating what a lot of the smaller ones have had or started with. OK, in any event, uh, well, Shell, this is an interesting one right here. Uh, on one of the sites in, in Worth Township, Butler County, a Shell person, not, not, a, not an official company representative from high up, but one person who was on the site uh, talking to the landowner where the uh, well is going in, indicated that Shell is planning on selling 90% of their gas overseas from the Utica area. 
Which may or may not be true. I mean, that person was probably told that by someone else in the shell company, but whether or not it's true, we don't know. So there, there could be a lot of myths out there that we have to be careful of. Okay. All right. Uh, this gentleman had a conference in Qatar. Uh, it's interesting what he says. We combined four great energy companies, Amoco, Arco, Castrol, and BP, in two years. Uh, obviously, the amount of gas being sold is going up. It used to be a 17% production. Now it's going to be 40% of their total production is gas. They, in fact, last year, it said, and this was back in 2000, they sold more than they actually had. Which doesn't mean it's not like you go into a store and you buy something. Uh, they essentially say this is what we're going to provide you with, and they sell it. And they, they have yet to bring it up and provide it. Of course, by now they will have done it. And then he says the world has 5,000 trillion cubic feet of proven stranded gas reserves. Stranded gas reserves. That means gas bearing rocks that essentially have not produced have not been tapped into, largely because back in 2001, the technology was not there to do it. And that's why we refer to the kind of drilling that goes on today where they go down vertically and then out horizontally and then do the fracking. We call that unconventional gas production because it's not the old standard, just drill a vertical well, frack it, and get the gas out of it. Uh, but anyway, his final comment was the challenge is to be a world-class marketer of gas, and that's what's going to happen. A lot of it's going to stay in this country. There's no doubt about it. But a lot of it's going to go overseas. So for the industry to say it's going to make us energy independent well into the future, it's, in a sense, it's true. In another sense, it's misleading. You know? So you have to draw your own conclusion on that one. However, and the colors don't really show up very well here, but there are four red dots right here. This bottom one is Cove Point, Maryland. This is New Jersey, that's New York, and that's Massachusetts. These are sites that have already been approved for new proposed LNG facilities for shipping gas overseas. The ones that are presently functioning to, to a large extent, of course, there's this thing up here in, uh, in, in Canada, but mostly they're down around the Gulf Coast. And there's some proposed ones down there too. And what's interesting, it's been estimated, and I don't know how good this estimate is, that 14% of our daily natural gas production could be sold other, overseas. Uh, why? Well, I've got that in bold here. Natural gas is three times more expensive in Europe than it is here. The companies can make a lot more money by even shipping it overseas and selling it there than they can by selling it here. <clears throat> From the Louisiana terminal, uh, the projected rate, the gas prices in the United States will go up by about 11.6%. Which means although we may have a lot of gas, we may become more energy independent than we are today. We'll probably be paying more for it, but that would be true anyway because of inflation. We always pay more for things year after year after year. Can I speak to that? Sure. How many of you heat your house with natural gas? You remember in 2008 when gasoline first got above $4 a gallon? That winter of 08, you also had a fuel surcharge on your natural gas bill. Did you notice that didn't happen last year, even though gas gasoline got up to $4? Because of the shale, historically, natural gas tracked in price with crude oil. When crude oil moved up, so did natural gas. The first time that that hasn't happened has been in the last three years because of the shale gas. Right. So, yes, in Europe and in Japan, Japan runs a fair amount of imported liquefied natural gas for power plants. That has all tripled as the price of crude oil has gone up. The reason your home heating bill didn't go up last year and probably won't be made, in fact, come down this year, is because of the shale gas. Mine went up. 
Did it? Get people's natural gas raised nine percent. Relative to what it was the year before. Check what it did in 08. In, in Erie, they've lowered the prices, but the, the spread between the price of natural gas and crude is now about two or three to one, as he mentions. Crude has always been a world commodity because it's easy to ship. It's liquid. You put it on a tanker and you ship it. Natural gas has been a domestic commodity because, frankly, it doesn't even pay to truck it. It only pays to move it through pipelines. So that to do most of those licensed export terminals began at, were designed as import terminals because five years ago, Shell Oil spent a billion dollars in Qatar, where of course Qatar is a big producer of crude and of natural gas. They could never ship the natural gas until they spent a billion dollars on a, on a liquefied terminal and the tankers, and we expected to import it into this country. Because of the shale gas in the last three years, all of that has reversed. Yes. And yes, now we're talking about having enough gas here. Incidentally, the amount of crude that we import in the last 10 years has gone from 60% of what we use to just under 50. And because the shale in North Dakota, the Bakken shale. Can, can we, can you hold this till we're done? Because I mean, yes. we'll never get through this thing. Thank you. Questions. But, but, yeah. If you think I'm wrong, there's please tell me. Oh no, we just want to hear uh, the speaker. The speaker. That, uh, yeah. There's also the statement that was made uh, by one of the industry people that the, the price of natural gas falls any lower than it is today. It won't be economical to actually get the gas out of the Marcellus and Utica. Well, the reason they're drilling can, can, we, can, we wait, 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 can we can we hold things till the end, please? Long presentation. Okay, well, let's, let's, I'll, I'll try to get through it here. No, no, uh, no, don't rush, Bob. Industry, politicians, they're saying that we should change a lot of the vehicles to natural gas, particularly buses and trucks. That's what they're saying, because it, it would create much less pollution and burning it. Electrical generating plants should be switching to natural gas instead of using coal. Uh, and that we would have energy independence for the next 40 to 50 years. And I don't know realistically if that's possible, if we're going to export as much as they say they're going to. I don't know. I'm not an economic uh, guru. Uh, but as far as I know, I've never seen any kind of comprehensive analysis done on it to show what that's going to, to do. So that's something that's still up in the air. <coughs> Increased job growth in Pennsylvania and other gas-producing states. We'll look at that one next real quick. And how much can you trust the news in any newspaper? I don't know. But in any event, they said that the Marcellus Shale has created 48,000 jobs, and that refers to new hires. But that's not the same thing as jobs created. Because new hires by the industry, and there's one I left out here, but it could break uh, be for replacing workers who have quit, who've been fired, retired, or enticed to lose, leave other jobs. And that's happening a lot. When a CDL truck driver can make 20 or 25 bucks an hour working for the oil company, he's not going to stay with a township clearing the snow off the roads for $15 an hour or $10 an hour. And so this has happened in a lot of places. How many of those jobs are for women? Uh, I don't know, but I, I would be willing to say that if you had a, a good uh, truck driver who was female, they could get the job just as easily as a male, but there aren't very many out there, I don't think. Of course, we will see a lot of females behind 18 wheelers. Yeah, well, okay, so there, there may well be, you know, there may be some for women. But one of the things I did not include here, I said I left one off accidentally, and that is that a lot of the new jobs in Pennsylvania are actually people who have come in from places like Wyoming, Colorado, Louisiana, Texas. You see a lot of Texas license plates and so on around now. Uh, but they, they are living here. They're renting. They're paying money. They're helping the economy for as long as the drilling continues and, and the fracking and so on. Okay. Uh, <coughs> However, that 48,000 
The Center for Workforce Information Analysis, Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry, actually said that it was only 9,288 jobs. So where did the 48,000 come from? Not only that, of the 9,288 jobs, this was back in 2007 and 2010, uh, ancillary industries lost 3,619, so where's the discrepancy? Well, the discrepancy is, is that the industry is saying that it's going to create all these jobs, but they're including the people who pump the gas at the gas stations, they're including the ticket taker at the movie theater, they're including a lot of jobs that I personally wouldn't say were, they are directly related to the industry's activities, yes. But they might have been there anyway without the industry, but the person might not have been making as much money or maybe not quite as many jobs, I don't know. But there's a discrepancy there and no one's bothered to clear that up yet. But this diagram shows something that does clear things up a little bit. During the development, that's the red here, during the development phase, the total direct employment is estimated to be rather high. Direct employment, uh, up around uh, 1,900 to 2,000 people, all the way through about the year 2019. Now, why, is it, why doesn't it just keep going up? Because there's many more wells that need to be drilled. One of the problems is there's not enough drilling equipment to do the jobs all at once nor is there enough, I, I would imagine, uh, cash to sink five million into every well and every site in, instantaneously. Uh, so in any event, that's what happens. The blue represents the people used in the actual production. And by about the middle of the 2025, it's going to get to the point where maybe if they do what they say they're going to be doing, there won't be a lot of new drilling or any new drilling hardly and it's going to be all production, and that's going to stay constant. So those people are going to stay here in Pennsylvania because they're part of the production process. Now, they may be Pennsylvanians to begin with who get the jobs, or people from Ohio, maybe some from Texas, who knows? But they're going to be living here during that time. They'll be paying taxes here, they'll be paying their rent here, or buying homes, whatever. So it's not, it's not that we're completely being invaded by outsiders. Okay, but you'll notice that by about 2050, as production starts tapering off, and that <coughs> might be unrealistic, and I'll mention why in a second, but there's got to be some kind of reclamation that goes, goes on, shutting these things down, uh, sealing them off so that they don't become a problem, and so on in the future. Uh, this actually may go on a little bit longer before we get to that point, because we've got not just the Marcellus, we've got, at least in the uh, northwestern part of Pennsylvania and the eastern part of Ohio, we've got a Utica Shale. Uh, and basically, once it, it tapers off, you can go back in and refrack it to release more of the gas. So it may go on a little bit longer. <coughs> 